Hi everyone, it's me again. I'm happy to report that I'm doing really well and that my recovery is going along really smoothly. I uh, still have a little bit of physical therapy to do, but other than that I would say that I'm about 95% back to whatever you would call normal. Um, I want to thank everyone for their kind words and their comments. Um, this has definitely not been an easy year for me overall, but um, it really touches my heart to read the comments and the support that you guys are sending my way. And please know that I read the comments and I appreciate it a lot. Um, I wanted to share with you some of the things, if you saw the episode where I mentioned uh, why I have been out of commission and missing in action, in that episode we actually shot in my uh, inspiration room at home. And if you did see that, you would remember that there was one um, shelving unit that was jam-packed with items from the 19, I would say the teens through the 30s. There were a few pieces that were a little earlier and a few that were a little later. But um, that is a representation of my extreme obsession and passion with the fabric LeMay. And uh, nowadays, LeMay comes in a completely different form. But back in the turn of the century through probably the early 40s, I would say, LeMay was made from um, metals, silver, copper, even gold in some of the earlier pieces wrapped with fiber and in in a lot of cases the um, the metal the, the fabric would tarnish or would oxidize uh, if it was exposed to air in in a in a bad way in storage so a lot of these pieces that are in the 70 to 100 year range are true survivors and uh, the pieces that I selected from my home are things either that I intend to repurpose or that need some form of restoration. So like for example, the dress that I'm wearing today is an incredible Devore velvet. The base of it is a lame and the actual pattern looks like a Poiré rose. And um, there's a lot of staining on this piece so I have to figure out either how I'm going to camouflage the staining or if I'm going to completely re repurpose it. So starting off, I'm going to say that LeMay fabric has always been associated with either royalty or the extremely wealthy. There are examples at the Victorian and Albert Museum, and it, it's interesting to note that metals were woven into fabric that far back. Um, nowadays, the lorex, which is a form of, I guess, what we would call LeMay, is... Um, it's a lot lighter, it doesn't tarnish, and it is much more malleable. It's much stronger to go through industrial machines to actually create the fiber. LeMay fabrics were costly, and um, in the early days, like way back, uh, the royalty would commission artisans to create garments for them, and there was... Um, regulation as far as who could utilize uh, garments made of lame. And actually in England there were laws that sanctioned uh, who could wear this precious fiber. So as we get into the 20th century, you know, think about the Edwardian period, like the Titanic people that were on the ship. A lot of people from the 20s into the glorious days of Hollywood, LeMay was a fabric that was used a lot. And you'll see examples that I have here. So Cotton Club, um, I just, I'm astounded when I look at these pieces because the lace is delicate and in many cases fragile and that they've survived the test of time to some degree uh, is really, to me, astounding. Um, on these mannequins, I'm going to start with, I brought from my home trim, yardage, and garments. And we have uh, quite a bit of LeMay items, old and older and new, on our website. So if this piques your cu curiosity and you want to see what we have available, by all means, please check out our website. So 
On this mannequin, we have a gorgeous 1930s halter neck gown. It still has its original belt, which is incredible. And uh, the pattern is a delicious uh, Art Deco organic with the leaves. And uh, the tarnishing is minimal. Uh, there is fraying in the shoulder straps, which is something I need to work on. But all in all, the condition of this gown is spectacular. Um, Mike paired it with one of our 30s rhinestone um, hand clutches. It's one that you would keep with you when you go dancing. And it's not big enough for a cell phone, so it's not very practical. But uh, it's certainly beautiful. So on this mannequin, we have a piece that really makes my heart skip a beat because it has definitely some areas that need restoration, but it's a tape lace, and it's a mixture of cotton and the bullion, the, uh, the, the bullion which is the metallic uh, lame lace. I use bullion because it's a metallic thread, and uh, I can intermix it with the lame. Uh, this piece has got an extremely deep décolletage. I have a feeling that the flapper girl didn't wear, um, I think she was rather risque because that was the whole point of that period. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing this piece finished. So, love this one. And then, on the rack, we have this gorgeous silver lame with brown threads. It's a drop waist, probably around 1925. Uh, it's a flapper dress, and uh, it's a heritage piece. If it's, if it's something that you love, adore, and want to wear, and you have kids or nieces, uh, this is a piece I would say would be a wearable heirloom. And then this yummy piece reminds me of the robe de steels from the time period of uh, also the mid-twenties. And it's a combination of a silk velvet, luscious, and this beautiful gold lame lace. It's short in the front and longer in the back. And because I'm so short, you can't really see the length, but anyway, you get the gist. Uh, the velvet, unfortunately, is shattering, and I can show you uh, back here and back here. So I'm going to have to replace the bodice. So I'll get to that one of these days, or I'll end up repurposing it, and it'll become part of maybe something that I end up designing. And then this delicious piece, I think, was actually made as a costume. Uh, utilizing uh, silver lame. And most of these things, by the way, are from France. Uh, this silver lame lace is in excellent condition. I'm not keen on the style because it's a little too choir roby for me, but um, it's a great uh, amount of fabric for me to be able to utilize and make something else or alter it in some way so that it's not so Mama Cass. Not that there was anything wrong with what she wore, but it's not a style that I particularly respond to. Now this one is great because it's also mid-twenties. It's a penne, a silk velvet, and it's a machine embroidery with metallic threads. So um, it's lame bullion threads, and um, it too is also in excellent condition. It has this wonderful serrated hem and the geometric detailing of the hem is pretty, pretty delicious. And the fabric is just scrumptious. This needs a little bit of work in the shoulder area. And then one of my favorites is this skirt, which is missing its you know, inner lining and its bodice, but it reminds me of Paul Poiret and um, it could very well be a part of one of his costumes or one of his um, designs. It's in beautiful condition, so um, what I end up doing with this, you'll have to stay tuned, because <laughs> I don't know at this point. And um, let's see. Oh, this 
I actually stole from the store. It's I stole a stole from the store. It is a wonderful double. It's folded over chiffon with the lame uh, grid, and then this delicious Art Deco flower um, and multicolor fringe on the bottom. And then Mike included, just to show a little bit of a comparison, this 1960s uh, ensemble that's made out of Japanese fabric. And you can see um, the sheen is different. This is definitely with a Lurex Lame, but it's this beautiful brocade. And it is, it screams uh, affluence because of the quality. And the design is very Jackie O, <laughs> so you can guess the date, probably 1962, I would say. And then on the table, we have an assortment of things that I would say most of these totally float my boat. Um, we'll start with this 1920s. It's cotton, a very fine mesh cotton lace with this gorgeous silver lame pattern and you can see it's a graduated it starts with a smaller kind of tulip head or cat head <laughs> and it graduates down to the scalloped hem and there's definitely enough here to make a beautiful skirt and maybe something else once again I'll tell you that most of these things were made in France and imported for the uh, Western market and let's see I want to say metals were really uh, used in a lot of ethnic traditions as well. If you think about the suits, for example, from Syria, uh, and they used brass as well as silver, as well as low-grade silver, their technique was to use metal strips, which are technically not lame, but from a distance it has a lame look. Um, I have a cloth of gold that's 19th century India. It's all woven lame and uh, hand-woven lame. It's really stunning. Um, but I would say everything in here is 20th century for the most part. And you know what? It is all 20th century. This is also another shawl that I, this is also another shawl that I stole from the store. Um, it is actually big enough to make a tunic or a caftan out of, but I don't have the heart to alter this because it's in such perfect condition. So I will continue to use it as a shawl. Uh, I love it because it has so many different colors, but the, um, the lame is really what frames the flowers. Back in the teens, 20s, and 30s, you could buy yardage from France that had lame woven into it. It's a beautiful example of Art Deco on a um, satin back crepe. And just little lozenges of silver lame throughout. There's just something so refreshing about the Art Deco period as far as uh, design. Visually stunning to me. And then continuing with lace. Oh, I don't want to forget this. So sometimes when I go to auctions or if I'm traveling around, I'll find pieces of a garment. In this case, I found a bodice. It's almost like a stomacher in, in its shape. And I found the sleeves, which I thought was spectacular. So I have the beginning of a garment. And um, yeah, hopefully one of these days <laughs> I'll have enough time to be able to create things with these beautiful things, right? And I wanted to show you also that this is couched bullion thread. It's not really technically a lame, but it's all hand-stitched, couched, couched is what it's called, on a moleskin, and it's the beginning of a slipper. So you can see this would be cut out, right? And this would be the top of the slipper. Spectacular, obviously for someone who's very wealthy. 
And for those of you that are lovers of the Art Deco period, you're aware of the fact that there was an Egyptian revival period. And this clearly was made during that time. And it's a great either um, border or a neckline. It's a combination of wool felt, I think, and um, chiffon and gold threads, which give the illusion of lame. This piece is pretty rare because it's yardage, it's silver lame, and there's absolutely no tarnish on it, which I have just am astounded after all these years. It's a beautiful, beautiful lame. And then some of my favorites are coming up. I love it when there's more than one tone in metal. And this has the copper and the gold, like a, almost a brassy gold. And it has a feeling of Art Nouveau, maybe arts and crafts. It's definitely before the Art Deco period. But what's wonderful about this is you can really, you can take a plain Jane anything and amp it up to the max by just adding some of these trims. In fact, that's what I do with a lot of the costume designers that are doing period films. They're looking to build costumes for principal actors, and they can totally make something look of the period just by using some of these trims. And it's better for them because they don't have to worry about the garment disintegrating while they're shooting, and it also allows them the opportunity to actually create an original piece for the main actor. So um, I have actually shown some of these pieces to designers in the past and um, or sent them images of things that I have that they may want to include. Um, also during the Art Deco period, there was a Japanese, um, a Japanese period. And this has a very, very Japanese-inspired uh, silhouette. The artwork on this, I think, is really beautiful. And interesting, too, because the lame is not only gold, but it's also this metallic blue. I love, 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 love this. And it's, be, it's embroidered on tulle, a cotton tulle, very fine net. And it, too, is in perfect condition. It has its original store tag, which is very sweet. And I love this. Once again, very graphic Art Deco pattern. And it's silver lame with the blue and the dusty orange. Just enough to, to use a border for a blouse bottom or skirt, um, a dress bottom, and also maybe cuff. Then I bought a collection of lame flowers. I literally <laughs> stopped breathing when I saw these because each one is different. A uh, few of them need to be cleaned. This one is the biggest and I think one of the best. I need to steam the pistons so that they're, they stand out. But Mike took photographs of all of these so you can get a better idea of the detail and the beauty of all of them. Love this one too. Oops. Oh, it's on a band. I forgot. So there's three on this one. So you may be familiar with bullion in terms of military epaulets and military clothing. This is an example of fringe that would have been used on a military epaulet. And it is not a very large piece. It's uh, just under two yards. But, you know, <laughs> putting this on really anything um, can totally change the feel. And it is untarnished and pretty, pretty wonderful. I have a lot of um, bullion, silver and gold uh, fringe. So I've never had anything like this before. There are two appliques. And they're scarabs that are sewn down on tool with the gold, the metallic thread couched. 
and um, I'm happy that there's two because then that gives me a chance to either, you know, create pockets or uh, if I was making a costume for Dita Von Tees. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there, there are, um, when you have two, you have obviously more options. Then one of the things that you'll see in the teens and, well, late teens and early 20s is there are, there's a draping where weight is important to help create the draping in a proper way. And so one of the things that they used were these tassels. And all of these are bullion or lame tassels that actually, like this one, has um, almost an opening to stick the fabric in so that you can have, uh, I think of Erte, for example. He used a lot of draped um, extravagant pieces. And so I brought a few of those to just share with you. And I'm going to pretty much cut to the chase with a few of these last pieces. This is all handmade lace out of a bullion, so it looks like gold lame. And there's two pieces, so it'll be integrated into a garment one day. And this bullion belt from the teens or the 20s, which has the green stones in the center. And all it is is piping that's been rolled uh, in the large with the green stones and the smaller. And then a straight line on the top and the bottom to hold them. It's a great design. I think people should copy this. Um, and I think this is the last thing I'll show you. We have a lot of Art Deco trim that's lame with uh, silver or gold. But this one I love because it's once again two-tone. It has the copper and the silver. And it's, um, it almost has a caterpillar feel to it. So anything that feels organic, I love. Um, first of all, hello, purple lame flower. Looks, it will look much better when it's steamed. And these grapes that are multicolored but covered with a silver lame, very fine silver lame mesh. And this was a hat ornament probably for the teens. I would say 1914 or 1915. And um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of lame deco trim. This one with the pineapples. And... This one, which is also two-tone or three-tone, actually, pewter and gold and silver. So um, if you like the 20s, the teens, 20s, and 30s, and you come across authentic lame, know that it's now considered very precious. Um, even the really good quality lame brocades from the 60s and 70s. But um, I started hoarding. Uh, collecting, I should say, these things um, maybe 25 years ago. So I have a healthy selection at home. Um, I, in my notes, I wanted to mention that Lurix was invented in 1946, which really surprised me when Mike did the research on this. And um, Jacques Grief was one of the first couturiers to utilize um, Lurex in his designs. So. I think that's going to be it for now. Um, please check out our website, and you can see some more beautiful examples of 20s and 30s, and then 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s lame. And I want to mention also that we just started to accept Klarna. Uh, a lot of people look at the website and get a little disappointed because the special pieces can be a little cost prohibitive. So we got Klarna to give people the option of a type of layaway without any finance charge. So for four months, um, you can utilize Klarna and, um, and actually uh, buy the, the item, and it's a done deal. So if you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber and you like this episode, please subscribe. And I tell you, we've got some pretty exciting things in the work 
books. I don't want to tell you what at this point, but um, we have some very wonderful people that are interested in coming in for an interview uh, or a talk, and stay tuned for that. And other than that, um, I want to wish you all safety, good health, and um, we really look forward to seeing you again sometime in the not-so-distant future, okay? Wishing you all the best. Thank you.